like I didn't watch it beginning to end. Uh, no, we watched Cable. Like, <laughs> which, yo, that's you. That is totally me. That's, <laughs> that's why I, did I was it. on silent. Okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, I ate a mic once. You ate a mic, and went by that. It's like. And we're live. <laughs> or not live. not really. We're, we're pre-recording now. <laughs> so welcome to my dining room, dude. Hey dude, thank you for having me, man. Thank you for coming out. You drove all the way here from well, Oakville and Toronto, and you gotta drive back there afterwards. Uh, so it's, it's not bad, man. It's <laughs> it's 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 worth it. <laughs> well, actually, we saw each other very briefly helping Ram it move a couple yeah. weeks ago, but yes. I don't remember the last time I saw you before that. Um, probably Ramit's um uh, House, Halloween party. Halloween party. Yeah. Okay, it seems yeah. like Ramit's couple. always in the mix. With <laughs> well, I mean, that's what happens: is mutual friends, and then we we end up at the same place at some point. So, hey. so what do you do, dude? I am. Well, my name is Del Hartley. I am a R and B artist. And you, uh, we'll we'll jump right into the launch because that's what you did most recently. Yes. So you were featured on CTV's launch. I went. I looked it up and I, I tried to do a bit of research <laughs> and see what I could find. So like what what happened on that show? What was what what happened? So for those who don't know, it's um it's pretty much it's it's a new format show. So essentially mm-hmm. it's uh they have a bunch of writers, um, a bunch of writers and producers. They make one song and they bring a bunch of artists in, up and coming artists, mm-hmm. and um they they hear their sound. If their sound kind of fits the song, then you cut the record and they launch the song per se. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now, what I, yeah, I didn't, like, I didn't watch it beginning to end. Uh, Nobody watched cable. <laughs> like, cable cutters were terrible. Uh, <laughs> I make my living in commercials and I'm, I'm not supporting them. <laughs> <laughs> Who were some of the judges on there? There was some pretty big time Canadian talent, if I recall correctly. I right? know Shania Twain. Yeah. Shania Twain was one of the, uh, one of the mentors on there. There was a couple other American acts. Cause I know with, uh, with Bell Media, um, there was a record label called uh, Big Machine. So mm-hmm. Scott Bruschetta, um, he's one of the, that was the first label that Taylor Swift signed to. Cool. So it's very, it's mainly country. Mm-hmm. Um, so they did a partnership. So he was the main head. Um, uh, there were different other, uh, the other Canadian was uh, Brian Adams. Yeah. Brian Adams was on it, Shania Twain and everybody else like Ryan Tedder. Those guys are all like American. Mm-hmm. So, um, which I thought was really, really cool. Cause like uh, right now I would say, Right now, at this point, it's a really good time to for music or for Canadian music because, like, it's a lot of all America or the market, the bigger marketplace yeah. is finally recognizing there's talent here, and now they're investing, and now a lot of us are getting shined. So, yeah, well, I mean, up until now, because at least uh, when I was playing music and kind of making that like a career focus about ten plus years ago, you didn't have YouTube, you didn't have Spotify, you didn't have these ways that you could reach those like mass markets. Cause at that point me and the guys were actually taking our CDs and sending them to record labels and stuff. Like that's the only way you could actually get your, your stuff out there (laughs) or to somebody. And like, and then it becomes a whole breeding ground of people that could take advantage of you if, oh. if they do like your sound, which it's, it's, it's a shady industry. Yeah, it can be. <laughs> there's some nightmare stories out there oh. like of, of people losing the rights to their like masters and music and all that sort of stuff. But now, you know, you've got musicians and artists who can create a following completely independent because they can just upload their shit to YouTube. And like what what sort of year like how are you tackling that like uh, is all your stuff up on on the various streaming platforms or are you kind of reserving it like how how are you distributing yourself i'm i'm everywhere so as of right now i know there's a couple online distributors mm-hmm. i know there's like cd baby was the main one but i know like uh, as of right now spotify you can actually upload directly to spotify mm-hmm. but i have uh, i go with another dis- uh, distributor it's called uh, amused it's an, actually an app will i am and um, a couple other tech people um, in Silicon Valley kind of put it together. So essentially you upload your track. You um uh, you have to upload like a week before. You have to give it a week buffer before it gets sent to all the stores. Okay. Um, but yeah, so you you upload to there. They send it to all the online stores. So that's Tidal, Google, uh, Google Play. Uh, is it Google Play? Yeah, Google, yeah, yeah, Google, Google Play. Play. Google Play Music. Yeah, 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 Amazon, Spotify, your iTunes. Yeah every store and it also tracks how much uh, how many plays from every single platform and actually mm. you get paid out yeah because you can generate i mean it's a, a fraction of a cent per yeah, yeah, yeah. stream actually it's like, changed it's oh, changed so oh, now oh, actually art oh, yeah okay. it's, oh, shit. It's, it's, it's different but it's not like <laughs> it's not like it's crazy like if mm. you're if for any other artists that are that are listening to this or watching this per se yeah. if you're if you're in this just to make streaming money you're, you're not gonna, you're gonna be very disappointed yeah you need well then you need merchandise you need touring like yeah all, all those things are what kind of culminate into an actual payday or a living? Well, I was going to say, Zach, 100%, man. Yeah. Like, artists, like, 
you make all your money on the road. Mm -hmm. I would say like the music is the promotion for the people who come see you live. Which is funny because I feel like that's a flip from what it used to be like back in the like 70s, 80s, 90s, basically up until this, until we all just decided to stop paying for music. The somehow. internet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we just somehow got away with not paying for music anymore is it used to be like people would not actually make as much money on, on the road. That would basically be the promotion for people to buy the single because then that was the only way you could actually get the music was right. to buy a fucking CD right. <laughs> like, or, or cassette or vinyl or whatever it was back in the day. Now, yeah, the, it's kind of flipped because now you can use your shows for merchandising. You can take your, your cut of like ticket profits and everything. And that's where people are actually generating a living, which... Yo, that's you. That is totally me. That's, <laughs> that's why I did I was it. on silent. Okay, hold on, hold on. Oh, it's actually on silent. Okay, let oh, me someone, airplane mode. Someone broke your phone. Oh, Lord. Okay, <laughs> we're back. I'm leaving this in. No, I'm leaving this Leave in. It in. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, going, it's going there just to show how unprofessional I know. You are, oh, man. my gosh. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had our process when I was in a band playing music, and it was mostly my guitar guitarists slash songwriters would get together and jam a song out. And then I just played drums. So I didn't really I didn't really write the songs as much. I was more just the percussion that figured out how to keep the beat afterwards. But you're still, that's well, I mean, it's, important. Off, it's very important. Yeah. That is a foundation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's the first thing we record. <laughs> but uh, like what's what's the process that goes into actually recording like R&B? What, what goes into that? I would say it's it's fairly it's fairly similar. Like it, it, all, it all depends. Like you can link up with a producer who gives you a beat and you write to it. Um, you can like I play instruments. I'm a, I'm a piano player as well as a guitar yeah. player. Um, you can come up with a couple, bunch of chords and write it and then take it to the studio, produce it and then cut the record. Or, you know, you can have a bunch of writers write you stuff and you just sing it. So there's yeah. different different ways. I know me personally, like I, I work with a bunch of I work with writers as well as producers cool. just to elevate the sound because there's only so much you can do. On just, your own. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, but like who are, who are you working with? So there's an artist, not an artist, is um there's a producer called uh, Architect. Okay. Um, uh, as well as another one. Um, his name is Gold Stripes, Daniel Gold Stripes. He's actually um one of the producers for uh, one of the other artists that's on the launch. Mm -hmm. uh, her name is Keisha Will. Shout out to Will. She's dope. <laughs> um, what's it called? Um, uh, yeah. So the, them two exclusively, and uh, I co-produce as well. And another writer, his name is uh, his name is Roly, talented writer, uh, talented slam poet. Uh, shout out to him too. It's gonna be a lot of shout outs. Um, but yeah, man, it's just like it's a whole team atmosphere, and at the end of the day, it's a vibe. Because mm -hmm. like I've gotten to, I've gone into rooms with certain producers, and like you know, sometimes you know they they're great people, but sometimes we don't gel, and that's just totally fine. And but who who funds this stuff? Like who? What studios are you kind of recording at? Or do you guys do it more independently with like home owned stuff? Because I have a couple of buddies who do music mm -hmm. like on on the regular, but they're totally independent they're doing it in a spare bedroom in their house or just working their ass off on their own right because yeah. using the the stuff they've managed to accumulate over the last couple of years like how, how are you going into the studio are you going to a specific place or are you working in multiple places like how, how does that go down multiple places so yeah. like i i pretty much make everything on my on, on my laptop mm -hmm. and we we run well we have different sessions a lot of us like i use logic pro yeah oh and on a side note like a lot of artists don't produce as yeah. well so and i would say like if you especially in this in this age if you want to be an artist you need to be well-rounded you need to know the business you need to know how to produce you need mm -hmm. to know how to write or at least like get a hands on it so you can when you actually go to a when you go to an actual producer, you can actually understand the terminologies and actually yeah, explain their properly language. exactly yeah. to get it done. But I'm 100 percent independent. I'm originally from Ottawa, so all the connections that I've made from the time that I've moved out of my parents' house to being here, going to college, finishing college, working, uh, meeting you know people like Ramit, meeting you, um, it's it's all yeah. <laughs> shout out to Mike. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's all it's it all it all it all works out and it all it all helps. So like I. Like I said, like uh, we, I make everything off the computer, um, like my laptop, mm. and uh, we have different studios that we go to, so we work remotely. So it all depends on uh, timing and mm. what's what's happening, and just using those connections to get free access. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and how how long have you been actually doing this though? This? Yeah, like uh, as as Del Hartley. Like. As I would say professionally, this will yeah. be the fifth year. Okay, sweet. this will be the fifth year. And like, how long were you doing it more hobbyish before that? Like while you were in school, or was it was it always kind of like the the end goal to get to doing this as your like full-time or was that more it became that later on no that was the goal from time i i think i knew i i knew like grade 10 okay like this was going to be the end goal and it was just like how am i going to get there how am i going to develop the skills how am i going to find the resources to 
to um, to get into the studios? How am I gonna? Who can, I, who can I find to mentor me to to put me on game to show me how production works and like the proper studio etiquettes and how mixing works and you know et cetera? So it's uh, you gotta be resourceful. You have to be. How often are you performing? Because uh, I've wanted to I've wanted to come out at some point, but I'm not always the best at following everybody's <laughs> shit. So, all good. but there's, that, that, on a side note, there's just so much shit out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to man. There's a lot of media that is just ever lost. consuming our time and not money as much anymore, but the time. Time is our most valuable resource. Exactly. Um, I play like minimum twice twice a month. Okay. Um, as of right now, actually, at, because of the launch, um, the vocal coach on the launch, Lorraine Lawson, shout out to Lorraine Lawson. <laughs> um, uh, but she's been hooking me up with like a bunch of corporate gigs. So I've been cool. sh- uh, playing a bunch of uh, weddings, meeting other musicians, meeting other people uh, that came before me that mm-hmm. are in the industry, and just kind of linking with them and and just building. In streaming culture nowadays, do you record albums or do you just record songs and release them sort of individually? Like, what's what's sort of your process for this? Because people used to do concept albums and like, you know, the, an album would have like a pretty, you know, sometimes well thought out progression from beginning with the first track to the end at the last track. But now we're so scatterbrained when we're listening to music that we're creating these playlists of thousands of songs and flipping back and forth. Like, how do you, how do you release your stuff? Is it right now? It's definitely like a singles market. And by that, it's just like, Put out a song, run a campaign behind it, do a cover video, do a lyric video, mm-hmm. shoot some like con- uh, shoot some shoot a music video for it, and try to try to you know extend that song and make it last for like two three months, and mm-hmm. that's realistic. Um, but yeah, definitely single based because like when you when you put like you said, we're we're also scatterbrained. Mm-hmm. If, you, if I put six songs on a CD, one it instantly becomes old to everybody. Yep. So all that time <laughs> yeah. we talked about the one song, so yeah. six of those it instantly gets old, and like you can't really. People are not getting paid off of it, so you gotta yeah. you gotta you gotta be smart with how you're how you how you're using it. Mm-hmm. So just try to stretch it out. So definitely a singles market. And if I if I do want to put out an album, like I'm I'm working on a project now. So yeah. if there are any key songs out of all, I have a catalog of stuff, and like I obviously know where where the strongest tracks are, and I'll just take some of those songs and I'll just recreate some stuff based off that to kind of follow a flow. So yeah, and you've got a bit of a video background too. Oh, yeah. So uh, a lot of the. I mean, you know how to actually produce content to supplement your music. Like, uh, wh- how many like music videos have you done? Because I know I know Ramit, for example, has worked with you a couple mm. times. You've got a you've got a couple of cinematographers that he said he's worked with, that, yeah. or like a sp- specific cinematographer that you like to work with a lot. Like, how are you using your like video sort of production knowledge to supplement your music career? I can just think. I can just kind of think beyond the record. Like, yeah. as I'm making a song, and like, I can think of a concept, mm-hmm. and then it's like I already have something so I can take to you know to, like to my guy or to my dop to be like okay listen here's my idea here's what i have so far what can we add to it mm. instead of just being like all right go nuts at mm. least i have some sort of idea and i have some sort of foundation that we can build on so are you kind of the creative uh, initial voice for whatever that is or do you is that also collaborative or it, collaborative it's, it's definitely collaborative like obviously at the end of the day like i do have the last say and i'm like i'm always open to like to for for new ideas because mm. like you can't do everything by yourself so if it, as long as it makes sense yeah, as long as it makes sense and people can kind of relate to it, um, we're we're doing it. <laughs> what when was the last one you did? I've seen, I've watched a couple. Like, um, I put out a cover video. I did like a Michael Jackson Man in the Mirror for like. A, oh, I haven't seen that. Oh, yet. Oh, um, but yeah, cover video. It's like a one take. Um, but yeah, I'm actually shooting a music video tomorrow. Oh shit! Okay, yeah, yeah this is a busy week. For yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you come here? Well, you, don't you no, have to prep for this shit? Or no, well, it's, it's fine. It's fine. When you work with uh, when you work with people that you usually work with, mm-hmm. it's you just need to get together, send them the song, and then it's just like a few hours before. Yeah, and it's it's a lot of the one take stuff. Um, less is more. Like performance kind of style yeah. video usually, because I mean that's that's a way to keep your budget down if you guys are kind of self-financing a lot of this exactly. stuff or, or calling in hugs and favors mm. who's your kind of go-to people here so dan wood shout him out shout out to dan wood <laughs> shout out to cycle um they're my guys like dan and i we actually when i first moved to um when i first moved to oakville from mm-hmm. ottawa we worked at a car wash nice at like appleby in mm-hmm. burlington oh, next door yeah o- auto park i don't know if you probably see it on the high i, I don't know i rock climb over at applebee <laughs> <in> roughly, so <laughs> but yeah no we we met there and like uh initially he was uh he uh, he played guitar mm-hmm. and then he kind of afterwards he's like uh he didn't think he was that good i thought he was good but he stopped and he wanted to pick up you know being a dop and he just kind of he didn't go to school for it he just kind of mm-hmm. picked it up and did it and now he's like shooting all, like all the stuff for cadillac fairview all the stuff oh, for, like shit. amex um and like we work together so it's so he's got he, a good do, eye. he does lots of commercial stuff as well yes everybody does commercial yes. stuff myself included there's money in commercials 
<laughs> so let's let's backtrack a bit though because you said you wanted to get into this in grade 10 like or that's that's when you said like that this is what i'm working towards um how old are you now i'm 30 now oh okay yeah. you're just a touch older than me i'll be 30 <laughs> in like 10 months hey no. um what so grade 10 is what 16 give or take yeah so that's that's now almost half your life that you've been like this is the the this is the dream yeah what what steps did you take starting in 10th grade to start working towards this well like in high school i was i, I never sang for anybody i was mm-hmm. a in the closet singer mm-hmm. um you know a lot of people i didn't think i had a great voice mm-hmm. um and like a friend of mine i used to a friend of mine that i used to work with uh, at kfc like my one of my first jobs ever <laughs> he's i was singing in the kitchen he's like yo you should like go ahead go ahead and do like our high school talent show mm-hmm. so i signed up I uh, I did the uh, I covered Usher's "You Remind Me" mm-hmm. and um, I went on stage, you know, scared, shitless, shitless, yeah. and um, uh, I go to go, you know, the the, the band starts, yeah. the first verse is about to start, me, yeah, all right, girl. but tell me why the mic didn't work for the first like half of the first verse. Oh, nice. Oh my yeah, god, so I'm just high like, school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> shout out to the audio guy. That was, <laughs> 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 he's probably not doing audio yeah. now. Um, but yeah, it was it was one of those things. I was like, oh my god, I. People can't hear me. And then once the mic turned on and, and then people are like, oh, my God, he's got a voice. He can sing. Yeah. And then I got the reaction. And like you, you know, when you do something and you, you get that feeling I'm like, OK, this this feels this is what I need to be yep. doing. That's what it was. And that from that uh, from that point, I've just been developing. Mm-hmm. Are you still scared when you go on stage ever? I uh, know. Honestly, no? right now, I would say that's the easy part. Cool. That is the easy part. Because like I, I find my like uh, i have a similar thing because like when i started directing content like short films and whatever i was always fucking terrified like going into production on a shoot day made me nervous as as all hell and it still does a lot of the time how which come? is how, how come? i i don't know i don't know if it's just that maybe that's why i like doing it because it makes me uncomfortable i'm so comfortable in 99 percent of my life you know what i mean like i work from my home <laughs> like i'm <laughs> like a white straight male there's not much i have to worry about ever (laughs) like realistically so putting myself into a situation that's uncomfortable for me is kind of a bit appealing i don't know like maybe weirdly no no, but um what's it called um uh, well being uncomfortable simulates growth so yeah oh okay all right we'll take that yeah Yeah. all right that's it it's because i'm growing it's 100 i'm gonna take your word for it (laughs) But yeah, that like, I mean, even when I was performing shows and stuff, like I had a similar feeling. I was always nervous. I don't know if it was because I was the one always managing all the shows we did as the drummer. I was always just in charge and scheduling and everything because none of my bandmates would do that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude, the shitty so, end, the short, the shitty yeah. end of the stick, man. So not only was I scheduling and, and getting everything moving, I was the one taking the longest to set up and... <laughs> They didn't help you? Uh, no, of course not. Oh I'm the gosh. drummer. I'm the I was the I was the slug, man. Oh, <laughs> man. I'm the butt of the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um but then okay, so you're you you start performing in high or you do this high school talent show, which is a pretty like I mean that's a pretty little storybooky way to start like a, a sort of music career. And then and then what? Like did you just start writing more music and and go from there did you i just started well after doing that i just got more i got more confidence mm. uh, i got more confident in the talent and i was like okay cool i got some talent let me develop it let me let me learn some more songs let me uh sing some more i didn't, I didn't start writing until like i n- until college yeah yeah but it was just like kind of experimenting and see what songs i like to sing and what notes i can hit because like I, I i honestly haven't really taken any vocal lessons until i didn't take any vocal lessons until like my third year of college mm-hmm. yeah so it was just like just learning and just kind of figuring it out and then and who was like who do you go to vocal like who do you do vocal lessons with was that- um so like um before going into media arts at sheridan mm-hmm. i i took a performing arts prep uh, preparatory course okay so it's kind of like a prep for musical theater yeah and um from there like uh uh, there were some teachers that obviously that, that taught. So I just kind of got together with them after uh, after class or outside of class time and paid cool. for it and just kind of helped. It helped a lot. Mm-hmm. It helped a lot. Even still to this day, like the like I said, the vocal coach, like I still work with uh, Lorraine Lawson and she she's dope. And it's not only just at least with her, it's not only just vocal perform. It's not only just a uh, vocal like singing technical stuff it's also performance so like what are you doing what a, what hands the mic in what gestures are you doing how are you engaging what are the thoughts what are the what are the um uh, you know what are the words what are the key words of the song yeah because like uh when you internalize those words it actually it it, it translates to the audience so i've never ever thought of that mm. in that <laughs> like i mean uh, i understand vocal coaching and and like singing lessons and all that but 
the coaching to actually go into like things like what what hand is the mic in like there's i guess maybe because i was just played drums and i just slammed on shit in the back <laughs> of the stage i didn't think about that stuff that you you have to be cognizant of what you're doing at all times because if you're if you're the front man if you're singing and that's your your job in that performance mm. there's going to be points where there's no vocals uh, and what are you doing yeah like <laughs> do you just like grab your leg and start dancing around like how how do you do that like I mean, what what do you do? For me, like I I love to engage the audience. Okay. I love I, I I always engage. I always encourage the audience to sing. I'm mm. I'm huge on call and response. I always tell people if you come out to a Del Hartley show, you are going to sing. Make sure you bring your voice. Um, but yeah, call and response. Always get the audience involved. Mm. But uh, but if you hit some little musical interlude where you're not actually singing, is it just a, trying to get them to like clap back or do? Well, it depends on the songs. Like yeah. there's some songs where it's like. Um, you, you know the guitar solo, and that's the guitarist's time mm. to shine. They're not listening. You, just, not, you just back the fuck off. I and, back up. I got. I got my water. I drink it. Yeah, you know, because it it does remind me of when we were young and amateurs, which we continued to be up until we stopped <laughs> performing. But we played a show, like big show, at what was then called the Docks, and now I don't even know what it's called anymore. It's do you know what I'm talking about? Like out uh, Cherry Street in Toronto. It was the Sound Academy. For oh, a it's while. now it's called Rebel now. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It goes through it's and it was something before the docks too. It just seems to change names every like five years. Yeah. So we played this huge show there uh, with several other bands and there was a, like that was the biggest show we ever played. And we were like 15 years old. Damn. Maybe there was like at least probably a good six or seven hundred people there. And my gu- guitarist, my lead guitarist and singer broke one of his guitar strings, but like we had a 25 minute set and we were independent and had no money. We didn't have guitar techs helping us out or any of that shit. So he just had to try to improvise when he could. And then at some points just put his guitar down because we didn't have a spare guitar. <laughs> we so I, And then oh, we start bringing a spare guitar to every show after that. But that was something he was like, I don't know what the hell, like, I didn't know what to do. Like I, like at some point he just put his hands behind his back and sang. Cause usually he'd be playing right. Like, and if he wasn't singing at any point, he'd be playing a guitar solo or whatever. So like you kind of talking about that is like harking back to my little performance nightmare that one time <laughs> when we screwed up two songs into the, <laughs> into the set. I'll tell you a little secret. Um, and Lorraine uh, t- uh, told me this when you, when you're doing a performance, the audience, they want you to succeed. Yeah. They want you to succeed. So all you have to, and everything that you do, they don't know what your set's going to be. Mm-hmm. As long as you're confident. Yeah. <laughs> That's com- true. It's fake it till you make it. Yeah. Like no one knows what the show is going to be except you. It's kind of like, like in musical theater or in plays on stage. As far as the audience knows, unless you make it very evident that you fucked up, <laughs> like, know. they have no idea. Like nobody is going to know, man. Yeah. And it's 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 good to even put yourself in those situations, man, to to, to fail and for things to kind of mess up, so you kind of mm. know and you can kind of plan because you know you being in production, you mm. know nothing ever goes a hundred percent according to plan, Never. ever, ever, ever. And uh, like, um, funny story. It's not even my story to tell. So like, um. I went to this music conference. Okay. Um, um, this is a um, singer songwriter artist. His name is Rico Love. Shout out to Rico Love. Um, uh, this guy, he's worked with, uh, he's worked with Usher. He's worked with Kelly Rowland. He's worked with like a lot of the big names. Mm-hmm. A lot of the music that's, uh, that I grew up listening to. Um, but uh, he said he was on, he was on tour with Usher. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, he wrote this one song that was on like the Confessions album. Dope album went diamond. And um, he, Usher brought him on tour and he had this like little rap section. And so, Every night he would come out, perform this rap section. You know, he's mm-hmm. like 18, 19 at the time. He's balling, eating shrimp. He's getting comfortable. And Usher's just like, you're, you're way too comfortable. You know what? Mm-hmm. Change up the rap every city we go to. And he's just like, like you don't change your words. Like, what the, <laughs> what the, what the heck? Yeah, so, but I'm Usher. Right, it's, essentially, it's exactly. like, do it or get off the tour, right? <laughs> so every city and like Ricola, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he memorizes his lyrics. He's like a little Wayne. He okay. doesn't write it down. Um, so he's going to every single city. He's walking. He's walking through the streets, kind of getting familiar with the city to kind of give him some, uh, you know, some content to write about. Um, he goes, you know, three, four, five cities. Everything goes well. He goes. He gets to L.A. Staples Center. You know, he looks in the audience like Kobe Bryant's there, like Madonna's there, Britney Spears is yeah. there, like you know, typical, every yeah, day in you LA. know, right. Yeah. And he goes on stage and like he says two words, forgets the verse. Freezes. So tell me why he's like, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 uh, uh, yeah. and like. 
Usher's laughing at him. Yeah. He gets off stage, goes on the tour bus, just kind of laughs, and he's just like, he he sleeps it off into like the next city. And Usher's just like, you know, what? I'm glad this happened to you because like, how do you think it happened for him? Yeah. Usher forgets shit all the time. And it's just like either, you know, people aren't going to notice or not going to give a shit. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Because so, at least at the well, at least when you're Usher, the fans there know your song. You can just if you if you brain fart your own lyric, which can just happen, mm-hmm. I imagine sometimes they can pick up the slack. <laughs> just let them do it. It's so true. It like, is so true. That's why with every single then cover, it looks interactive. That well, <laughs> that's the that's the key. Yeah. Even when you're doing cover stuff, like um, when you're doing songs that everybody knows, mm. you're entertaining. Yeah. When you're doing original stuff, people are like you're you're kind of showing and kind of teaching them. Mm-hmm. So like when it comes to cover songs, you have to make it like engaging, and that's why I like depending on the show, I always try to gauge like who's coming or what kind of age group or what kind of crowds coming out, and mm. then I choose my co- covers accordingly. So when I do it, they can sing along, and I can get them to sing. So is that is that the kind of stuff that you ask? Like if you're at a wedding, if you're doing a wedding, mm. is there like, you know, you ask them like what sort of what? Well, I pref- I imagine you go to the bride or you're in touch with her and be like, what are you looking for? When it comes to if if I was like the main contact for the wedding, yeah. usually they give a list of what you want, what they want yeah. to play. And that's that's part of the reason why, like, I personally don't like doing weddings. Yep. I don't mind if somebody hires me on to to come and sing a couple songs that I already know or I can mm-hmm. learn but when it comes to that, because like at the end of the day, like I'm an artist, I want to yeah. do my original music. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be a wedding singer. Yeah. No disrespect to anybody that's that's a wedding singer. It's 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 you know it's it's a lane. Yeah, but, but that's not what I'm. Sometimes it's just a gig. You gotta exactly you gotta make, make a couple bucks. Is, like, exactly, and that's the thing. So like it's when it comes to cover stuff, I like I always tend to do like sixty thirty or sorry, seventy thirty. Okay, seventy percent original stuff, thirty percent cover stuff. Just mm-hmm. so like there's a balance and it kind of gives them a break because yep. when you play. You know, you, you watch an entire set of stuff that you don't know. It's kind of, it does get taxing. It's kind of a bombardment of just like stuff that you're unfamiliar with. Like people, will, people go to a lot of shows to listen to the songs they know. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, it's cool to, you know, do one or two or maybe three songs that they don't know and then kind of have like a party for like a, the, the song that they know. Mm. And then, you know, it's and one thing, one trick that I do um, when it, I have some songs that I, that I, that have like a lot of call and response within it. Mm-hmm. I'll always play it after a song that I've got already gotten them to sing. Okay. Yeah. And I always put that in like within maybe, maybe the first like 10, 15 minutes of the set. Cause once you have them and you got them to sing, you got them hooked, you got them hooked. Yeah. What, what kind of covers are you doing when you do this? Oh, like anything from like John Legend to like Usher to like, you know, even like Justin Bieber yeah. to like Seal to like even, Nobody does R. Kelly anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, we're, we're dodging the R. Kelly yeah. bullet on that. But on one. a side note, that lane is wide open. So <laughs> honestly, like, I feel like my, my voice is very versatile. So like, mm-hmm. no matter what it is, I can put my own spin on it and do my own version of a song. So. Yeah. Is there any like licensing that comes with doing covers at, at weddings or shows like that? Because like, I mean, we had a mm. couple covers back in the day that we played, like punk rock bands that, you know, are pretty small scale. And we weren't we weren't playing as regularly. Um, we do like a show every couple months. We might do one cover in it. So we were, mm. and it was, this was the early two thousands and mid two thousands when not everybody could live stream something to their, to the internet right away. True. Like, is there any, is there any legal gray area for doing covers like that? Or is it just kind of, you can, eh. you can, it's pretty much that it's, yeah. you're, you're covering, you're doing a rendition of a song. So where yeah. it gets tricky, if you try to record that and sell, and then it, sell it, then the, you're, you're pretty much, that's the publishing where it's the idea of yeah. the song and you're trying to make money off of that. If you're trying to monetize off of okay. that, that's where the trouble starts. So, so actually through. performing covers is kind of just wide open, fair game, pretty like, much. because you are, you're performing, you're not trying to reproduce and necessarily monetize off of it. Exactly. It's, it's only when you get to that point where you want to cover it and put it on an album or put it up on Spotify or something for profit that you'll start to get flagged exactly or if you throw it up on youtube someone will copyright claim universal yeah will all, copyright they're, claim they're, that cra- right they're cracking on that like, <laughs> like a lot now but it, but good though because yeah. like it's if i put a song out and you know a lot of people well you understand how much mm. effort goes into making one song one song <laughs> yeah yeah so you're, you're spending it's all these hours money months months yeah the time whatever arguments you're you're, you're the, whatever back and forth that you're mm. trying to debate with the people that you're working with and then you put it out and then somebody just kind of goes and snipes in. it and somehow it's so probably. deflating did man. you hear though <laughs> so this someone i'm gonna have to look this up this guy put a song out uh on youtube like he just uh, some kind of electronica dance song okay he had no copyright on it he just created it put it out and it, it just went kind of viral got millions of views or or whatnot and then like two years later Universal had an artist sample it 
and put it into their song. They released it. And then Universal filed a copyright claim against the guy who originally did the piece and they won. Wait, what? Yeah. How? Because uh, because they they filled out the they actually went through the copyright process for this new track that sampled his stuff and they basically were able to demonetize the original track that they stole. It might not have been Universal. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to fact check this it's, afterwards. It, it's some it's some label, but it's some that's the, that's some the shady shit. shit. That's yeah. the shady shit, man. <laughs> like, Dude, and like, well, that's because we all stopped paying for music, so they're trying, <laughs> trying to generate revenue somehow. It's ridiculous, and like, honestly, labels they're they're hurting, and I I, I understand it's business, and they, they only care about their bottom line. Yeah. But honestly, at, at this point, as an art, like as an artist, you don't need a label. Yeah, you know, for the first time ever, too, don't like need you a label. Can just do it all yourself, but you gotta like watch your ass when you're putting music out there to cover yeah, yeah, yeah. your own but that's of, why like, when you, intellectual property. Exactly. But that's why when you um when you go through like a distributor, yeah. like it copyrights and it saves all that stuff and you actually have a barcode for all mm-hmm. that stuff too. So if anything happens, you're covered. So mm. what what do you think was your biggest like holy shit moment when you're uh performing? Like your biggest kind of mistake or or failure so far? Cuz I like to get into that because I think the whole the whole pathway to success is multiple failures 100%. along the way. 100%. Um, well, yeah, with that, you don't, you don't learn from not mess. Like you don't learn from not fucking up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say like the biggest, the biggest. It's a tough question. I, <laughs> I ate a mic once. You ate a mic? And what, by that, it's like, I mean, you're so into the performance and then the mic picks so, you in the oh, mouth and then the it face? hits you. Everybody hears it. Yeah. Thunk. Yeah. So essentially. But, but much harder. Yes. And without, <laughs> without the softy. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> uh, I would. <sighs> Probably that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like for me, I like, I'm very particular. I like to plan things out mm-hmm. so that if things kind of go off, at least I have an idea of where things are where going. You gotta, where you got to wrangle it back. <laughs> right. To. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, like I tried not to put myself in those kind of situations. Mm. Um, but uh, actually, no, I, I do have, I do have a moment, but okay. it's not, it wasn't my own show. So there's a, there's this thing called a uh, practice. It's a, uh, it's like a little, it's pretty much like a jam session that happens in Toronto. Like a lot of musicians go, a lot of like, um, a lot of artists go mm-hmm. and it's pretty much like um, they have like a six uh, piece setup, and anybody can go up and just play whatever and it's cool. like a huge jam so one of my writers he's uh, he was trying to get me out of my comfort zone and he's just like oh yo like we need to go up and like you know and do something and I'm just like you know I don't really know the song and like I can hear the chords but it's like it's hard at least for me personally it's hard for me to freestyle and come up with things I just like to you know hum melodies and come up with things and then add words to it and then refine it and then you know perfected and then people can actually feel it so i'm just like i don't know why i said yes so i go up (laughs) and like they're they're jamming on these uh on on this progression and i'm just like all right cool like i i know some songs that are kind of in the same key and i can kind of do like some flips Mm. so i'm like all right cool so group goes up we're next in line and i'm like all right cool i'm ready to do this tell me why the guy's just like all right we're gonna stop and we're gonna change it up and we're gonna do this thing (laughs) called oh my gosh right he's like we're gonna switch So he's like, we're going to switch it up and do this thing called imitation. It's, it's really cool when you're on the audience side. It's just like, we're, we're, we're going to play a song and then the band's going to hear it and do their own interpretation of it. And then these guys okay. are going to go freestyle over it. And I'm just like, I wasn't, the, I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? I'm just like, I'm not even ready. I don't even hear what this is. And it, yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. Yeah. It was like one of those like just ad libs. Yeah. I, I, in my eyes, I butchered it. And I was just like, you know, it's fine. It's not, well, it again, wasn't my show. Confident. I <laughs> I don't even remember. Uh, uh, I, I don't even know. I'm going to venture to say no. M- maybe just, maybe or maybe not. But the, the other thing about that, it wasn't like my own shit. Yeah. yeah people so. weren't there to see you specifically. Exactly. So, so was, people don't care. Yeah. Don't even They're just there to have a good time. And, and yeah, I used to go to this bar uh, out in Port Credit that is not there anymore. But they did sort of an open jam night. They had a band playing like a, a full set. Mm. But you could go up and just take over one of the instruments and play a song with them. And that was kind of the extent of my performance, musical performance career later, <laughs> once once we hit drinking age. But what's what's cool about music, at least, and I had an idea for a documentary that I still want to do one day, mm-hmm. um, is it's sort of a, a universal language. You know what I mean? Like whether, it doesn't matter what genre it is, but I've always wanted to take like five or six people who play different instruments and different styles and put them in a room together and they're not allowed to speak. They just have to start jamming on whatever instrument they have and just go with it. Because I think no matter what, if as long as they know how to play that instrument, you're going to end up with 
a piece of music. They Something. don't. They don't have to say shit. They they can make. I I I would actually prefer if they don't even make eye contact. Like you just hear someone start noodling, and I mean you could try it both ways. But <laughs> like, I was gonna say like the doing it without saying anything. Yeah, definitely work. But without eye contact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard? Uh, this may be a little bit off topic, but no, it's, like, no. it's, like, it's like a drama game. It's like maybe you get like five or six people, or maybe ten people in a circle, and you have to count to ten without somebody saying. Oh yeah, the same yeah. number twice. Yes, yeah. That's what that would. be Or like. with like two people at the same time saying the well, same number. Well, it's like number. one, yeah. two, and if somebody says three at the same time, you got to start, yeah, back, start over back over. Yeah, That's yeah. what that would be like. Yeah. Without somebody. Which I guess looking. you can. You can make eye contact with that, but I mean, then you got 10 people who are trying to make eye contact with <laughs> and, one another. But, and play like different keys. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I mean, I like it because I'd love to take someone who's like a punk rock guitarist and then like a jazz drummer mm. and fucking like a, a R&B singer and like a violinist and like a classically trained like saxophonist or something. I don't know. Or an upright bass or some shit and just throw them in a room and be like, play. It's like make a new genre. I did actually <laughs> apply for a Bravo Fact funding for that idea once, but they didn't give it to me. Yo, do it again. <laughs> Bravo what? Fact doesn't exist anymore. Oh, damn. They're gone. Damn. <laughs> they don't, they All don't. the funding. I know. So little funding now. <sighs> so, yo, if you want to collaborate on a documentary <laughs> project. <laughs> I, I'm kind of down. Actually, I got this cool initiative. So, like, I, one of my partners, we're, we're still fine-tuning it. Um, essentially, it's, it's going to be pretty much like five artists, mm-hmm. five chairs, five microphones. I'm going to get, like, every artist to perform three original songs, maybe one cover song. And it's going to be like one song after the other. And I want to switch up like, so I don't want to have like all R&B artists. I want to mm-hmm. have different genres in that way. It keeps it fresh. It kind of gives it like a playlist vibe. Cause mm-hmm. you've been to, everybody's been to a showcase where there's five artists, mm-hmm. each of them play for 10, 15 minutes. By the time you get to the third act, you've already forgotten about the first yeah. act. So Those are what most of the shows I did back in the day were. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, it's not fair to all the musicians where it's just like, you're going out, you're doing your thing. And then it's just like, Oh, but then, well, it's not, it's it's kind of fair to both parties. <laughs> You're or you doing people that show up for the people they know and they skip the whole first yeah. two or three acts or whatever. So yeah, this way it's like you, everybody gets a chance to shine and it's different, but it's like it's still kind of the same vibe. And then by the time you get back to the third person, like, oh yeah, this person was actually really really good. Yeah, oh, I really like this person. Kind of so. kind of refreshes the memory on what you've already listened to and seen. And then I mean that can also build up a bit of like a fan base and it incentivizes like audience members or viewers to actually watch it beginning to end Mm -hmm. because if you watch a little bit and you like especially if you like one artist more than another you know they're coming back afterwards and it forces you to stick around for whatever else is kind of happening in between exactly it keeps it it keeps it fresh it keeps it fresh we did it at um um we did it at uh coca so coca is a uh it's a conference. So pretty much all the colleges and universities all over all over Canada, the, all their student unions get together. And that's mm. how they book their their acts for Frosh Week as well cool. as for the semester. So Didn't we, know that. Yeah. So um, I, I found that uh, the only reason how, why I know about that is because um, uh, when I was at Sheridan, I used to um, be in student union for mm-hmm. the production team. And then um, that's how I found out. But yeah, we did that. And like it's they were, they were saying it was like the best show that they've had in like a while. Because like in the past, um, in the past, uh, the past conferences, like people were falling asleep. Yeah. And it's like it kept people engaged. People were having a good time. So then from there, we took it to Ottawa. I recently played Blues Fest. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Blues Fest did last, where we're in August, the so last month. And we just, uh, one of the days, we booked out another venue. And we just, we reached out to a couple of art, uh, other artists. And we kind of did the same thing. So it does two things. It it's, it brings something new. It creates community. Um, as well as it's it it also kind of creates a um uh, like a like a um I'm gonna say like a playlist but a list of different artists that you can you can collaborate with and mm-hmm. it also gives other artists who don't really have like a platform to shine or the experience the opportunity to go out there and kind of test material so nice yeah you said like you like to hum melodies and then start to like write lyrics for it or or whatnot do you do you write lyrics first or do you do music first and then apply lyrics to it afterwards or do you do a little bit of both music first yeah music first um and then li- well, music first, melody, and then lyrics. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like a song is the is the canvas, it's the atmosphere. So it's, um, I would, for me personally, I know some other people, they write lyrics before music. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's like, I, I need to feel what the music is saying before it's like, okay, cool. This feels like this, or this feels like a situation like this. And then okay. it's like, all right, have I gone through something like that? Has somebody else gone through something like that? Oh, what? And then we kind of start building from there and it just snowballs into into a song yeah yeah that's what we kind of did as well like they'd the my guitarist would kind of noodle around and figure out the the skeleton of the song and then we'd get together to actually put to put all the music together and we'd have like a full finished instrumental piece mm-hmm. 
before anyone ever even like thought of lyrics. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it works, man. Yeah. So, so then uh, you play piano. Uh, is that like primary instrument that you would consider yourself as playing? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I've been, I've been uh, learning to play more guitar. I, I set my, I set a personal goal by next March. I will be playing guitar in my shows. Nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, like mainly, um, in my set, the, like a lot of like the, the slower ballads, like yeah. maybe one or two songs, I'll play with the band. Yeah. So it kind of gives it more, you know, just gives it like another layer in the show. When did you start playing, like playing piano? Uh, pretty much around like grade 10. Fuck off. Seriously? Around, around grade 10. But it's all by ear, man. It's all oh. by ear. So like when it comes to. Because I feel like learning an, a new instrument at that age is really difficult. You know what I mean? Cause like you can learn an instrument when you're little, mm. it's like learning a language. Like yeah. kids who are immersed in like five different languages will speak five fluent languages by the time they're 10, put an adult into five different languages and it's that they'll never speak again. <laughs> <laughs> Cause like, I, I mean, I've always wanted to play piano and I can't, I but I'm not good at it. I can play a couple little melodies. I feel like trying to learn piano now would be extremely difficult. I'm actually right very shortly picking up violin, which is going to be really. I would say like, <laughs> so I've just been, it's that it's just one of those instruments. I've always thought like, I want to learn how to play the violin. I can kind of strum a guitar and like play some songs. I can play drums, but uh, yeah, my buddy bought me a violin as a wedding present, like nice specifically because I've just talked about like, yeah, I want to like learn violin one day. And it's something I could just leave in my office and fuck around with, right? Hey. But I imagine it's going to be extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah, well, I, honestly, with everything, there's always that. There's always going to be a learning curve. Mm. But it's just like it's this how much time you put in. Because even with a guitar now, like I, I, I make sure that I play. I play ten minutes minimum mm. every day. Okay, every day, and like the nights, like this week's been a crazy week. I've been getting up at like like six and getting home at like three, four in the morning. Mm. When I get home, like I'll smoke a joint and mm. I'll play for. I'm supposed to play for 10 minutes. I'll play for 45 minutes. Yeah. But then it's just, I make sure every single day I am you're picking it up yeah. at some point. You say you're getting up at six and going to bed at like four. Only this week. Okay. Only this yeah, week. But still, that I'm, sounds I'm, fucking crazy. But it, you got to do what you got to do, man. It's, it's, it's the grime. Man. Yeah. I know. Right. Yeah. I, well, I, yeah, it's been a crazy week for me too. <laughs> a little more personal side of things, but I can't like, that's surprising though. Cause I feel like grade 10 is 16 years old is really late to pick up an instrument, especially when you're going to keep playing through and performing eventually. Maybe it's just because I started playing drums at the age of like nine. So, well, I was going to say that my mom wanted to put me in like piano lessons when like when I was way, way younger yeah. and like I did a lesson and I was just like, I can't do this Yeah, because it's just like, it's, it's classical. Your people are telling you to, to do whatever or for like the way that I learned, it was all instinctual. Like yeah. it was all instinct. I was just like, all right, cool. This feels cool. Mm. All right, let me go on. Let me go on YouTube. Let me try to find, let me try to learn a song. And at the end of the day, the chords, they all feel, they start feeling the same. Yeah. And then you build off of that. Is it the first instrument you actually kind of learn to play, play? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And like, I would even say like, I'm, I'm, I can, I can get by and perform. Yeah. But even when it comes to like, uh, I would still let my keyboardist, I, I still let my keyboardist take my ideas to the next level. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you'd probably like play something, kind of write the piece, and then potentially hand that off to the like a keyboardist who is a fucking pro at exactly. piano to actually like record it or perform it properly. Like, uh, if it's not one of the sort of slower ballads or something that you're kind of performing. Exactly. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of similar to what I do because, like, I can I can handle a camera, <laughs> but I'm not a cinematographer. I will hand that off to somebody else, especially if I have the budget for it. I'll yeah. hand that off to somebody that can do it much better than I can. So I don't spread myself too thin on the, whatever project we're working on. Uh, I can, yeah, I can noodle with it myself. But <laughs> I, we did have a, we did have a small keyboard here for a while cause we borrowed it from Melissa's mom, but then she wanted it back. It's oh. <laughs> another thing I was like, I should just buy one. They're like, I mean, like a, a a keyboard to noodle around on is what you can get it for like a hundred bucks. Or yeah, something. I was like, even gonna say like get a MIDI controller. You yeah. can every Macintosh has GarageBand mm-hmm. or Logic. It's easy to just load up uh, load up a uh, a sample a sampler on uh, like on that DAW mm-hmm. and just go to town and play and just like you know experiment. So when it comes to making a career though out of out of music, um, that's extremely tough to do, right? Like for anybody it's not i mean even filmmakers like we have commercials and stuff that we can do that at least has budgets and supplement can supplement like an income if we're not making movies Mm. which is what i do Uh, i have a buddy who is uh 
working really hard to become a professional musician. Like he is right now he quit his job entirely and is just focusing all his time on this while he's got a bit of money saved up to okay. live off of for a bit. But he's like, yeah, I might need to go get a part-time job or something. I mean, like where, where do you find the balance for yourself? Because like, are, are you making a full-time living that you can absolutely live off of music yet or no? No, no, no. <laughs> Now where so, I want to be, because honestly, when you're when you're creating, obviously, when you're, when you're creating without without a budget, mm. like there's still going to be some things you got to pay for. Yeah. But it's like it's not like you're getting uh, like that that huge return because you're always constantly building and you're building your brand and you you have to you have to be strategic with the with the marketing and mm-hmm. like et cetera. So it's like it's definitely not it's definitely not why full time, but mm. it's like where I, where I am right now. I just know like the, the, the I work a part time like side hustle gig yeah. and I just know that'll be the last part time gig I ever have to work. Okay. Until the, I do this full time. So that's what like that, that's your kind of means to an end right now is like you're, you're doing this part time gig to pay bills basically so that you can supplement whatever your expenses are and then focus the rest of your time on on this. Yeah, precisely. Technically right technically right now like it it um like my my part-time gig it takes care of all my all my personal expenses yeah. and then any, anything left over I can well it goes Get to music back and, into the music. And, and all the other time that I have it's either I can do other like side projects cuz I still do like production stuff and commercial stuff with my guys. Yep. Um and anything any well all that stuff is extra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cuz that's like that I I just want to like I want I want to know realistically who's like how you're making a career out of this because like that's especially with social media being what it is, right? Like, I mean, you've got a, you've got a decent little social media following now, mm-hmm. like on your, your Instagram and stuff. And all of our social media platforms are very curated to look a certain way. Yeah. Right. But I want to be like totally real about this is that like, even at that point, people need fucking jobs. A hundred percent. And like, I know, I know a lot of musicians that like, that do it full time, but yeah. then they're doing gigs that they don't like to do. And, yeah. that, and that's so deflating, man. It sucks that you're, you know, you're you're working a passion, but then you're doing something. It, it kind of slowly starts becoming a job. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like, like I said, at the end of the day, like I'm, arti- I'm an artist. I want to do my own original stuff. And I don't want to have to rely and like learn like 80 covers just so I can, you know, I can eat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you don't want to be the, like you said, you don't want to be the wedding singer. Like no. you'll do it. Yeah. Like I'll do it once in a while. Yeah. It's good practice, but it's not like that's not going to be the bread and butter. No. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, I guess it's similar to, you know, the, uh in the film business at least, like these grizzled old like grip veterans who are just fucking miserable on set <laughs> all the, ones, the time the because they've just been doing it and they're so jaded from like <laughs> forever doing this. And like they might have been excited about this career originally, but then it just became a job. And then and you don't want to turn your sort of creative musical passion into just a job. Yeah, man, it's it's that, yeah, you don't. But <laughs> but is that tough too? Because I mean, some people would find having to work that extra side gig as also like a, a fucking grind. You know, like if someone is trying to make a passion, especially people who are just like uh, who are not as financially secure, whether they've got like student debt or whatever that they have to pay off, like having to work like that extra job to pay off just debt alone can be fucking deflating 100 <laughs> percent. but that that's life man and obviously everybody's situation everyone's situation is different mm. but it's just like you have to be smart about how you uh how you move mm. and like if you're if you're working a job it's like okay cool like i'm working this job it's gonna give me some money but what else can it do what other things can it provide me like am i meeting new people mm-hmm. um uh does this uh like, does this place have gear that i can probably use for my for my benefit like on the off hours mm-hmm. does um, like what other bonuses, like, cause you have to, you have to be resourceful. So is that like a, is that something that people should look for when they're looking for that sort of side hustle? If they can't afford to make a living off of their music right now, try to find, like, try to find a strategic gig basically is kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Cause it's, uh, it's either you're going to work a job that you hate that makes a lot of money yeah. or a job that's all right, but it has different perks. Mm-hmm. So it's all about how, how where, where you compromise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else is kind of in the works for the next, say like six months or for like 2020, for okay, example. So for 2020 right now, like uh, we're looking to break into, like I said, the college university circuit. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the COCA conference, we went, uh, we did that, we killed it. Um, there was a, so pretty much in America, there's the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And one of their representatives were over there and they told us to come down and do the exact same thing. So pretty much between like the college and universities, um, we're trying to get into like the festival circuit. So I did my first festival this year and just networked my ass off and yep. just, you know, made good impressions so that, 
Um, like Which is what it's all about. Exactly, man. It's it's all about who you know and who yeah. knows you. And like, you know, if you're if you're a nice person and you're talented, it's going to take you so far. And on a side note, my math, my grade seven math teacher told me this. <laughs> I forget her name, but she's just like, good manners will take you anywhere you want to go. Yeah. Yes. Because there's so many, I've met so many talented people who are assholes and it's just like, nobody wants to work with them. No. I've said that before. I would rather work with someone who is good at a job and awesome to work with than someone who's amazing at their job, but they're a dick. I will take the former before the latter any day. Like, (laughs) because it'll just make, nobody wants to work with an asshole or no one wants to have to be miserable while they work, even if they're working a job they like. Like, Exactly, man. But um yeah, so the college university circuits, the um uh, the the festival circuits, but I'm, yeah. I'm more open to the networking and just uh you know just to build Making that relationship and, exactly. Yeah. So um but yeah, there's that. Um, I might have you be, ever done like a tour tour or not yet? Not yet. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. That sounds like a grind. That was one Dude. of the things that I was like very skeptical about when I was focusing on music. Is like hitting the road for weeks on end sounds tough. But the, but <laughs> right now with the internet though, there's there's so many tools and there's so many like different uh, like applications that you know people are coming up with to make it easier. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this one, uh, this is one service I forgot, uh, I forgot the name of it. I would I would totally I'll, like to give him a I'll shout out. I'll super it up after <laughs> we'll think of it. But essentially, it's it's kind of like you can. Um, it's kind of like crowd. It's kind of like crowd crowdfunding, okay. but for for shows. So it's like all right, cool. Like within this three weeks, I'm gonna book here 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 i yeah. want to see how many people can pledge to come to these shows so you confirm your number of people the uh, people that are going to be at the show so you know ahead of time how many people to, uh, to expect do or they least, have to pay in advance like um, if, they're, they're, if they're buying they're going to go, tickets yeah okay yeah so it's if they're going to go because then it's not like you're like i pledge to go and, and then, then they don't show go, up and you, you don't get paid yeah, you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah with this like they pay and like you you know exactly what what your numbers are and where mm. you can grow so there are there are definitely like a lot of things that are there's so many tools out there, man. So many tools out there to help and make, uh, you know, make the journey easier. Yeah, because what, what? Actually, my buddy was talking about this the other day that like the way lots of tours are designed now is like artists will know that they have like somewhat of a, a base here who will show up and somewhat of a base here that will show up. So we'll book these two cities, but we can also try to book something in between them that we're not as confident in that we'll have the turnout, but it can be an opportunity to start a new base there. So it's like a strategic, like, again, these are things I never thought of. It was just like tour. You just go city to city to city to city and fucking go. Like (laughs) there's, there's a actual method to the madness of scheduling and organizing a tour to try to boost your own like brand and your, your sort of brand awareness too. Right. Like, which is, which is also just a huge part of it is your own just brand awareness. Like, it's not just a matter of playing these shows and building a city. Like you, you, you as a human being are a brand now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, the, I almost just lost my train of thought. Um, uh, da, 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 your da, brand. Da, da, your human da, brand. Da, uh, touring. Before the, yeah, the touring, it was. Strategic uh, touring. Strategic Locations. touring. Um, yes. So when it comes to touring, like the the thing when you start it, you yeah. kind of have to keep it consistent. Because mm-hmm. like going back to what Rico Love was saying, he was like, you when you go to a place, it's like how many times have you done this? How many times have you opened for somebody? Because mm-hmm. some people are like, oh, I opened for, like I opened for Snoop Dogg, but I'm just going to, I'm not going to be like. Every single time, yo, I open for Snoop Dogg. I open mm. for Snoop Dogg. Some people are gonna be like, okay, what else have you done? Or how yeah. many times have you opened for somebody? So it's like my mindset is just like, how many times can I do something? Mm-hmm. How many times can I keep it consistent? Because when you go to a city, you know, maybe five people might come out, but you still have to play that five person show. Like five hundred people are gonna yeah. be there, so that when you come back, that five will turn to ten, mm-hmm. ten to twenty, twenty to forty, and then when you come back, everybody knows your stuff. Yeah. I've definitely played some empty empty halls before. Oh, 100 percent, man! It's great. It's uh, honestly like I, I would find you just having band practice on stage. Essentially, man, and like the intimate shows. Like going back to what, going back to the question about if I still kind of get like stage fright yeah. or kind of get nervous. Like I get more nervous about the intimate shows mm. than the large festival sets. Mm. And the reason why because it's like as a show you kind of have to have some sort of like, fluidity or some sort of cohesiveness and like kind of break down the songs and kind of create a vibe whereas the bigger festivals people want to party yeah. they don't want to hear you talk so it's like it's it's good to kind of be like hey how you guys doing yeah make some noise da 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 here's this song da 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 do the yeah. song call and response sing da 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 sing <laughs> yeah so it's just an overall you're just like you're there at those big festivals it sounds shitty but almost as a bit of a background noise to 
people's macro parties out in the festival. Yes and no, because they, they want they want to keep the they they, they want to be engaged, yeah. but it's not like they, they don't want to hear you talk. They're not necessarily like all eyes on you 100 percent of the exactly. time. Exactly, people just shooting the shit down in the pit or and they're, whatever. They're enjoying the tunes, and like yeah. when you have like a bunch of people out in a field or whatever the situation is, and you're there talking for like five minutes. Yeah, like <laughs> that's a no go. See, I've always thought that because like I mean. Or I've always I've always been curious about that because I've watched like live concerts of bands I like, mm. and I've noticed that at the bigger shows where there's lots of people, a lot of times they don't talk at all. They just blast through the set, and then it's like these smaller things where they're like you know playing somewhere like the Danforth, where pretty much everybody is there to see them. Yes. Like that, they are much more. Uh, interactive with an audience in between set because they have, I guess they have the platform at that point. They're they're there because they know their fans are there to watch them. So they can do that sort of shit and they can make a full show out of it without just playing the music. Exactly. When you're doing some big, you know, 10,000 person stadium show or something, it's just like get through the songs because there's going to be people there that are expecting music to play, but they might not be straight up 100% locked in on you. the whole Exactly, man. So, yeah. I uh I haven't been to a show in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you need to come out, man. I know. Well, okay, when when are you playing next? I mean, the it'll next... be out of date by the time this goes out, but um I will maybe we can put in the next link cuz all the yeah. gigs that I have now for this month are all corporate gigs. Ah, okay. Um but um it'll probably be the yeah, corporate, man. Actually, another cool gig. It's it's not 100% confirmed yet. Yeah. But um uh Martha Stewart. So there's there's <laughs> Martha Stewart and Snoop. Martha but... Stewart and Snoop Dogg. So there is a there's a tech conference that's uh, happening in Toronto. That's still such a weird combination. I know because Mar- <laughs> <laughs> So what what happened was there was um the show that I was doing in Ottawa. There was somebody who um who came out and uh, her she she loved uh, she liked the stuff she liked the stuff she didn't come out to she didn't come out to Blues Fest. Mm. So um so the the show that I did at the um, uh, for the one song at a time was more like an intimate set, whereas the blues fest was like more energy and like yeah. all that other uh, more high ener- high energy. So it's she a told festival. her exactly. She told her sister, and her sister's actually curating this event. So she's like, "Yeah, we already have Martha Stewart locked down, and like we saw that you opened for Snoop Dogg." She thought I knew Snoop Dogg and had the concert <laughs> for Snoop Dogg, and I was just like, "I am flattered that you yeah. would even think, think that? that I'm like in that." But that's <laughs> that's cool, but I'm like, no. you're like, yo, I have a part time job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! I'm gonna try that next time. <laughs> but um, just uh, so you know. But yeah, so like um, they they were they're reaching out to Snoop Dogg because obviously the people know the dynamic between yeah. Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg, and um, yeah, so we're we're doing this gig. That's pretty solid. But the okay, corporate gigs. What what goes into a corporate gig? Because again, the this is the this is why I like sitting down with people and talking with them about their their art because there's so much shit that. I don't realize happens. And I'm sure there's a lot of musicians out there and performers who don't know about this stuff too. Like what, what, how do you lock a corporate gig and what goes into that? Well, there's several ways you can either get an agent, but if yeah. you're doing like hundred percent independent, it's just all about network. But, but I mean, what is the corporate gig? Like not, not the oh, specific okay. one you're doing, but like, what is a corporate gig for, what does it look like for you? So I would say like any, any kind of gig, any kind of company yeah. that's looking to have something, have an event or, yeah. Um, have an event for like a, a big party of people, like employees, employees, or clients, or, or whatever. Or like, for example, like the ROM. I would, mm. I would, I played their their Friday Night Live, like, I think twice now, and like I would consider that a corporate gig. Okay, yeah, because it's not like they open the doors out to the public, but it's like big big company. Yeah, they're hiring me out, and it's like half an hour, and they have obviously have a bigger budget. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's where all the money is corporate. But I mean, like that's, uh, have you ever been hired for those sorts of other like events? Like, you know, some big company somewhere wants to throw a party for their employee, some employee appreciation type shit or something. Like, have you ever done stuff like that? Like, would that be considered corporate realm? And is that, is that something that some artists do get hired for? Y- yes. And yes. And no. Well, a lot of artists that are, I guess, established now, yeah. they would, they would reach out to, well, these corporate companies would reach out to them to yeah. come and do a set for their, their employers or whoever mm. their guests are for the event. But I would say like in, in my situation, like a lot of the uh, other corporate gigs that aren't like some, somebody's reached out, like it's either somebody's heard the music or seen me live and they're yeah. like, this guy is good, book him. And him. then it's like, they kind of take a chance and then we, we do our job. <laughs> Cause uh, I'm now wondering, I went down to uh, Tampa, Florida for a sports net shoot january of 2018 okay and it was like for the uh nhl all-star game and i got tickets afterwards to the big like nhl um after party which was just all 
employees of the various networks doing stuff and NHL like employees. No players were there because <laughs> they wouldn't be. This was just for the people that work at the offices. But they had fucking Flo Rida perform at this thing. Like it was it. But this was like closed to the public. Like you needed uh, tickets to this VIP event by virtue of being affiliated with either a network or the NHL or whatever. Someone from production, essentially. And they had Flo Rida. And it's like I I. I I, I was I, I mean it was the funniest concert I've ever been to because it was the whitest audience ever. I'd be surprised, <laughs> you know, like they 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 really like they they really mess with like a lot of urban music. Yeah, like, but I, I mean I just just like all these like middle aged white dudes and they were losing it to Flo Rida. <laughs> I was just like this is such an odd. Like just, from, it's weird to experience. Well, yeah, like, <laughs> especially as someone who's not as into like hip hop and and like most contemporary mm. pop out there right now. I was just like, this is hilarious. Like, this is just, it's such seeing all these like balding white dudes just rocking out to Flo Rida. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is like, I was really glad I experienced that. And how long did he play for, you know? <laughs> it was a long set too. Like I would, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm estimating an hour maybe. Oh, he probably got like a bag for Oh that. yeah, probably. Dude. Like, <laughs> like there was, there was backup dancers. He had his DJ. Like it was a full, like it was a full performance. Like this wasn't some like, you know, intimate and interactive type shit. This, Damn, was, this was big. Well, the, and that's, that's what I'm trying to work myself up to, man. Just mm. keep doing these shows. Yeah. Keep, uh, keep putting out content and just keep building. Keep trying to uh, cross promote and work with other companies. And uh, like, so it gets to a point where I can do corporate gigs, play for an hour and mm. get me paid $40,000 a show. Yeah. I know, that's, right? That's, yeah, that's that's what this hustle is for. And well, that's well, that's what you build up to, right? Because it's actually like it, it's I don't know in the world of arts and like filmmaking and music and all this, the discrepancies in budgets and like how much people make is absolutely crazy. Because like for a small time artist to go up and do like a hour long set at a small like bar for a overall film festival might be a couple hundred bucks, maybe. And then if you get into these big corporate events with like actual like performing professional artists who have a name, then yeah, 50 grand for an hour long set. Like, and it's, that's, and that's not even that expensive. <laughs> no, right. That's the thing, man. Like I, I got, I got, I got my hands on like a list of like a, of, I guess like prices of artists yeah. now. Quote and sheets. It's, oh dude, it's like, it's insane. Yeah, it you, get, insane. you can get easily up to like over hundreds of thousands of dollars for to, an hour. To book a de- like, guess how much to book a Dell? Fuck, I'm gonna assume half a million 70, minimum. Seven hundred, three quarters of a million. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, does that does that just cover her, or is that like her probably and her the entire band production? And, like, the production exactly. And then, but then, but still, <laughs> yeah, seven hundred fifty. So that is that for like seven hundred fifty k for a Dell? Would that be for? a televised appearance or is that just like that's for minimum a like a show like what about on her tour like that's not what people are well like the tour like, the tour, tour is, is different her, right yeah, like, well it's different because like with the tour because she signed yeah. so a lot it, the label would front a lot of that cost yeah so they would pay they pay a del so pretty much when it comes to like big artists on tour they get paid before the tour the, the yeah. first even uh, the first tour stop okay and then it's and then it's up to the label to recoup the funds afterwards okay so yeah. they're paying them in advance to to actually go through with this tour and exactly then, okay they recoup so, on the back end so so then that would be like if the fucking super bowl wanted to book adele for uh, the i mean super bowl would obviously be way more money the corporate gig that you're talking about with yeah. floor rider they booked Adele, yeah, seven hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm assuming the Flow Rider probably took home like a cool half mil at minimum. That or a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, really, only a hundred thousand. Yeah. I, well, that sounds only that sounds only hundred thousand. <laughs> and look, in the real world, there's lots of money out there <laughs> in the hands of very few. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh yeah. It's I know, nuts. but I mean, like, I work with NHL players too, man. And I know, like, what what it costs to get these people out to just do anything. Just to like, just for like a like a social thing. Yeah. They don't even got to do like, anything. Have you watched, have you watched that Netflix documentary, like American meme, I think. Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where like, they, it's they, about Paris Hilton, how she, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it kind of follows a couple other people. But like one of the girls was saying that like, she got like the highest she ever got paid for like a single Instagram, like sponsored photo was like a million dollars just to post one fucking photo on Instagram. Like that's how, that's how much of a reach <laughs> social media allows some of these people. And like, I look at some of these like YouTube uh, personalities who are just shooting vlogs in their bedroom 
and they've got like, you know, 2 million subscribers. Like those guys are making hundreds of thousands of dollars per month, probably yeah. in ad revenue or and sponsorship. Like a YouTube video sponsorship can be 10 grand just to give, just to do that little like one minute, like download this app. It's a great, or a Squarespace, like, you know, go to Squarespace and set up your website today. Like yep. there's so much money in advertising. <laughs> And that's why corporate is good. Yeah. And it does, that's why it doesn't surprise me. That's why I'm like, yeah, a hundred thousand just for that show. Like that feels low to me. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's flow rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I was there, I did the same, same gig in uh, San Jose last in January, but they didn't have a big name artist for this one. They actually had, they had this, this band shit. I don't remember their name. Cause they were really tight. They were like the closer. Like they were a black, they did all covers, but it was like a 12 person band, like full horn section, uh, woodwinds, like two drummers, like a so, drummer. And a so were they here or no, this was in California okay, when yeah, I was yeah. uh, at this after party and they did all covers, but they were solid as hell. Like they were, they had everybody moving and again, didn't talk at all. I like, I have no idea what any of these people sounded like in conversation. <laughs> um, so I don't know, maybe their budget was just cheaper this year. <laughs> they couldn't afford flow rider. But they, prior to that, they had another band on stage that kind of like opened for these guys and they were an all string band, like violin, cello, like all classical string instruments doing contemporary pop songs. And it was sick. It's crazy. Like just all covers, no vocals. Like, and I was totally on board with that because I was like, I want to learn violin one day. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my gosh but yeah even just hearing that idea it's 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 you know thinking outside the box yeah. you don't see that stuff every day yeah and so. these guys got booked i'm sure i'm sure like they weren't making adele money but they probably got paid probably busy pretty pretty good chunk of cash to come out and play this nhl after party event like mm. yeah like there's there's all these sorts of different avenues and it all comes down to connections i'm sure that somebody knew somebody from that violinist band or you know down the line and they were like we need some artists for this event who do you got like uh, well you know i saw these guys at some festival a while back let's let's call them see what their what their quote will be like that's pretty much how it works yeah (laughs) like i mean i don't get i don't hand out resumes anymore i just (laughs) i get all my jobs through word of mouth so (laughs) there's lots of things that lots of different avenues to make money or do performances or that a lot of creatives and, and musicians and artists don't actually realize it are out there. Like, yeah, and it's, <laughs> it's just about finding the connection and the right people for it. Like, or, or rather finding the people that are connected to these sort of events and open yourselves up to those opportunities. You know, the, you, there's like a saying where it's like, you don't pay. What is it? It's either like, a, I think it was for a designer, but I saw it on Instagram. It's like, you don't pay, you're not paying me for my time. You're paying me for the, for how fast I do the work. Mm. So essentially it's like the same thing when it comes to a lot of these influencers who have like millions of followers, they built it over time. Yeah. Like I know some people that have, you know, they've been doing it for like five years and within like, within that five years, the first three and a half, four years, mm. it was like nothing. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and then like within that year and a half, then that's where it starts to go. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Cause it's just about, it's about trying to roll with the momentum and at least keep it going. Exactly. I mean, this is why with, like this podcast, for example, um, you are the 10th one I've shot, I think so far, but I haven't released any yet at the time of recording. (laughs) I have not released any of them yet because I know that, I mean, the, the problem we run into as creatives is we need to constantly pump out content to keep people engaged. And like you said, you know how much work goes into making a song one piece. (laughs) Like, so, I mean, if you write, like it, it, we're in such a like single sort of single music culture. Like you might write 10 songs and record them. Like odds are you're not re- releasing them all at once. You want to just put out a, like a, a slow drip to keep people coming back to you, which is exactly what I'm doing with this podcast is that I want to get a whole bunch ready so that I'm not playing fucking catch up. Yeah. <laughs> Cause like everybody knows life happens. And yeah. It's, 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 it's a smart thing to do, man. You gotta be prepared. And especially with this ADD culture. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean like just in the last, like for me, for example, and since I did the last record uh, a couple weeks ago, I have gotten married and I had a family member pass away and all that stuff like that was I mean, I saw the wedding coming. That was that was. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine is this And something? I mean, we we did kind of foresee my family member passing away, but uh, all that stuff eats up time. And as much as like life is for the living, you got to you have to divert your attention to these like the the everyday living issues and still try to work on your your art and your craft and keep the momentum going. So 
it's it's about strategizing that as well, right? Exactly. Bad and rolling with the punches, like you said. And the yeah. cool thing about well, I want to say, well, when things happen in life, it's a lot of our art is inspired by life. So it's kind of we have to take those things and sit with them. It's it's there was a point where I was just always in the studio and not really like being out in social. And I was just like, man, I'm not getting anything done. It's like, why? Cause I'm not out really living. Yeah. It's like, okay, cool. Like I'm making, I'm making productions. I'm making some beats and I'm making some cool hooks, but it's just like some of the songs I'm not really feeling. And why? Because it's, you, you kind of need to put more into mm-hmm. it. You kind of need to live, you take a step back, live, come back and then bring those experiences and put them into songs. Mm-hmm. And that's where the magic happens. Then. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, art is motivated by living and you have to take your experiences and apply them and create with them. Cause yes. yeah, sitting in the studio all day, every day is going to hinder your motivation. Like, I mean, fucking you can go out and just people watch for an hour and come up with something based on that. But if you don't go out and just people watch for that hour, <laughs> you might like, there's no inspiration in that point. Like you, Go sit at Union Station, downtown Toronto oh, for you know, 45 minutes. Talk about. You'll have stories. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, you okay, you opened for Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg, like, Wu-Tang, k oh, okay. Yeah. When was that? And why did I not know this? July. This is July 13th. It's the last month. Oh, okay. This is very recent. Very, oh, very shit. recent. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. I sound like an asshole. For no, 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 no. Come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I know you don't have Snoop Dogg's cell phone number. <laughs> you can you get him on the podcast uh, <laughs> how, how like how did you lock that one down i would say that came from the launch one okay. of the biggest things the cool. launch did for me is so it's opening more doors yeah whereas like i've always been i've always been developing and trying to hone my skills but it's 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 not like anything that i'm uh, that i was doing two years ago it's mm. not like i'm not doing it now yeah it's now people are seeing it and I've, i'm more credible now that i've been on tv or uh like a platform that's you know that well a, that's on television yeah <laughs> once you're on television it's like okay cool this person does this yeah and it's it's so weird because even like now like on social media like like i'm verified on everything mm. now and it's it's weird because people are like oh my gosh you're verified now and i'm just like what like what, what does it what's mean? different it's like what's really different it's like i was doing the same shit but it's yeah. like now you guys just see it and pay attention to it yeah so it's just like so then like who reached out to you to to instigate playing with Snoop Dogg and oh, Wu-Tang and shit. So, like, like we, we, we applied. You gotta, you gotta oh, apply okay. for these things. Yeah. Oh, so a lot of right. these festivals, you can you can apply. Mm. And the thing is, it's like they look at the application, they look at the songs and look at what you've done and then it's just like, okay, cool. Yes or no. So it was just a matter of like filling out some paperwork and, and crossing your fingers. Essentially, yeah. Well, that's a pretty sweet gig to land that way. Well, that's it, <laughs> that's the thing, man. It's, it's it's like I said, like the launch has opened so, so many doors and mm. it's because you do that and they look it up and they're like, okay, wow, we should get this guy on because because of x or yeah. y and then you can just kind of keep building off of that so. so i presume you didn't hang out with everybody afterwards though um you? i got to hang with um uh, with wu-tang i got to oh, hang nice. with uh, ghostface killer um uh, one of the other guys hit on my girlfriend <laughs> 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 we talk about it it's pretty funny but um uh like all, and all these guys are the, reg- the regular guys yeah man. oh Reg- yeah regular dudes man and they're just so cool um I, my my trailer was right beside snoop dogs nice which was cool my mom had a really good time there too. Sweet. Yeah, she Sweet. she got really wasted and like enjoyed the, all the free booze Excellent. and the free food as, as she should. Yeah. Um. But yeah, man, it's Just the weed emanating off of Snoop Dogg's. <laughs> off, of, off of everybody's. He's like, yeah, it's it's legal here too now, like federally. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's totally true. Like they're uh, same thing. I I mean, not that I'm a huge sports fan, but I do so much stuff in sports media. Like I've worked with NHL players that not that any of them would be like, yeah, Mike. I remember hanging out with him. <laughs> But they're everyday dudes. They're du- and you know what is what I found at least working with like some of these NHL players. If you don't talk to them about hockey, they're the shit. They are so chill, so much more open. And I, I think that's similar with like actors and and uh, musicians. Talk to them about real life shit because that everybody talks to them about whatever their art is, whatever their craft is, and as much as they might love doing it there's only so much you can talk about with it constantly, especially with just some random you run into at a party or that you're like hanging out with like i don't want to talk about this shit right now <laughs> i live that shit every day <laughs> it's like bring me something real <laughs> yeah but that, i mean that must be kind of cool too because you know being an independent artist and being able to play on the same stage with these like legendary hip-hop 
artist. I mean, what was it like? How many? How long was your set? I mean, I don't know what the details. My set were. was forty five minutes. Oh shit! Okay, so, so that's that's pretty substantial four, too. Forty five for... minutes. So like uh, the cool thing about that was uh, my little brother he DJs. Nice. And it was his birthday, so I was just like, you know what? You can open the set. So nice. I got him to open for like maybe, like seven, maybe ten minutes. So my set was actually thirty five. No. Okay. And that's that's a key. Yeah, that's <laughs> a birthday present right there. Oh yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but like it was, it, it's cool. Like a lot of guys on the team, they keep saying that like I haven't. Like, I, I guess I'm not really taking in the moment, mm-hmm. but is this like, okay, I, op- I opened for Snoop Dogg and Wu-Tang. Mm-hmm. When am I going to do it again? When's the next thing? I guess yeah. like, that's just where my head and my mentality is. I don't want to get locked or trapped in the whole, I'm not trying to settle. Um, so, yeah, but it's, it's I, I just look at it like I'm making strides. Because mm-hmm. at first I was just like, okay, I want to sing. Do I, I just don't want to suck. And then it's one thing from... You know, learning, uh, learning and performing a cover song to writing your own or first your your, your first original song, mm. then to doing your first gig to now playing with people that like, you know, that you see on TV, mm. and then you're seeing them in real life, and then you're actually engaging with them, and then it kind of brings it kind of makes for me at least it makes the world smaller. It's just like okay, cool, wow, the, you can you can do this, mm-hmm. you can do this. <laughs> yeah, and like, did you ever see when you were starting out or when you were in tenth grade and decided to start? making this a big focus you ever see yourself at this point like already or like did you how long did you think it would take like what were your expectations at 16 as to like when you were going to make a career out of music well at 16 i was just like oh man i'm gonna move to toronto yeah. i'm gonna be 21 i'm gonna blow up and i'm gonna go on a tour <laughs> but then you got to be realistic and really yeah. know about the game because at 21 like i didn't know anything about the business side i didn't know about publishing i didn't know about masters mm-hmm. i didn't know about uh, like I didn't know how to mix. I didn't even know. Like w- when I first went to my my very first studio session here, um, like I try to sing, the, I try to track the song from like the beginning to the end. Yeah. And the engineer's is like, yo, that's not how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like all those learning curves, man. But like my my 16 year old self, like I guess looking back, saying that yeah, you you open for Snoop Dogg and Wu Tang, and the people were gonna sing your songs and engage with you. I would have been like, like. Well, duh. <laughs> duh, 30 year old. <laughs> but yeah, no, but it's just like, it's, and going through the motions and, and finding my own process is, mm. it's, it's humbling because, like, it, I'm sure you're a Gary Vee fan. Everybody, yeah, well, every, yeah, yeah. everybody's, I, mean, I wouldn't say I'm a fan, but, but like, I've, I've watched his shit. Every, I, everybody pays attention. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's just like, it's, it's, there's no, maybe that's a horrible analogy. I would say, like, the, Rico Love explained this the best. Okay. Like a lot of people say, like when you see a lot of one hit wonders or a lot of artists that are like super young and like super successful, mm. those are anomalies. Yeah. All anomalies. You got to look at it like this way. You're at, you're at a basketball court when you're, you know, like, that's me. Oh my God. Again. <laughs> Weren't you on airplane oh, mode? No. You I, took it off airplane mode? I was, mode. I was, I was. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. How many calls do you get? Oh. You took your phone off airplane mode like three minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the Is that week. Snoop? It's this week. Can you get him? Can you get him out of here? Facetime him. Facetime him. Um, uh, what was I just saying? What was I just saying? Um, uh, you know, we did say Gary V. The, all the people are yes, anomalies. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So anomalies. So it's just like you got to look at it like this. It's like shooting a half court shot. When yeah. You go when you see somebody shoot a half court shot, everybody goes crazy. Yeah. That is the one hit wonder. Mm-hmm. When you and you, you the mentality you have to have is you have to keep working on your three point shot you're working on your shot mm. so when you you know you're working on your shot you're working on your shot somebody comes and shoots it from the from the half court they go crazy nobody's noticing you yeah. but by the time they notice you you're going to have 50 points while the person who's shooting half court has one yeah so it's just like you got to it's all about depth yeah <laughs> well no that i mean that's true the the big thing i think a lot everybody has to do especially starting a career in music, filmmaking, acting, whatever, is like actually temper the expectations because I I did something similar. I was, I got into film school. I got into Sheridan College. Or my, well, it took me three times. I got rejected from media arts three times. Really? I finally got, yeah. Well, the third time was a wait list, but the first two times was flat out rejection. Then I thought, all right, well, now I'll go to college. I'll graduate. Then I'll start making feature films and I'll make a, li- which I don't know why I thought that, but it's like you that's not realistic. That's not how the world works. You see like these, you know, some of these filmmakers and, and like actors and stuff who are like now, now actors are younger than me, like big name actors. So now I know that I'm like an adult <laughs> <laughs> when it's like, you know, game of Thrones stars are like 25 years old and I'm like, fuck. All right. But those are, those are totally the anomaly. Those are the exceptions. They're not the rule. And there's not, that doesn't necessarily mean that that actor, that artist, that musician, that filmmaker is more talented than you. They just somehow 
broke the system a little bit. The circumstances. Yeah. Whether it's through connections or just the right moment at the right time. Like it just seems like because the whole industry of well-known people is built on the exceptions. Mm. And I've said this before where like filmmakers or musicians and actors, we're represented by a very elite few. Like, you know what I mean? Like you as a filmmaker, I might never be, I might never win an Academy Award. Like that's, Odds are I won't. <laughs> like realistically, you gotta speak that into existence. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, realistically, but, odds are I will not hit that point. Like, it, I mean, it's tough to make a feature film, let alone become like get to get do an Avengers Endgame or yeah, make a two billion dollar film or yeah, win an Academy Award. But there's so many rewarding careers in the filmmaking business that don't require you to be at that level same in the music business like you could be a performing recording artist making a healthy living without being someone who gets to command seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for a single show you know what i mean like and you could be totally happy and make Uh, a lucrative career you're right like i mean uh a buddy of mine uh lives in burlington makes uh he's a musician but he he does other things as well like he's fully self-employed he does like some visual effects work and music stuff but he does uh jingles and stuff for commercials nice. and he like loves doing that yeah like simple <laughs> like a 10 second jingle will net him a couple grand like and those are the things he does for money so he can just do his own musical shit on the side like hey. you know what i mean and you can make a perfectly if you if you're okay not becoming a megastar you can totally make a living doing this stuff. There are so many artists, like America is so big. There's yeah. so many people that live in certain states that are making like seven figure incomes mm-hmm. that people don't even know about. No, of course. Yes. So it's I'm sure there's <laughs> people in this neighborhood making seven <laughs> figure incomes, eight figure incomes that n- nobody knows. Nobody about. knows. No, hundred percent. Like, and that's even better. Cause like, I would rather have money over than fa- over yeah. fame. Cause there's some people that have a lot of fame that don't have any money. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like we like actors too. I mean, there's plenty of actors who are working consistently that you and I wouldn't necessarily know offhand. Like they're in every single show, like, you know, whether it's like one offs per episode and, or they're doing voice work on the side. Like my, uh, my buddy, Scott professional voiceover actor, nobody knows who he is, but these, he's making a full-time living with his voice. You know, I want to kind of get into that world. You, you, Your voice acting is sick. Yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> I totally want to do that. Like, well, but, but, using your skills like you literally use a microphone oh yeah all the time <laughs> facts like but facts. so like i mean that's a translatable skill that could open up another avenue of revenue or just like connections as well like you if you have a good voice you can land those sorts of gigs like mm. what's his name do you know socrates he's a like oh, yeah, Toronto rapper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah like i've done i've done promos and stuff that he's done the voice work for like uh. i've just received his files and like they hired him to do voiceover work and he's he's a rapper, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he is, yeah. So I mean, like that's already somebody right there who is a rapper, and they are also exploring other avenues to just generate revenue because they have the skill set. Like mm. either people get too wrapped up in their own little passions, maybe, or their own art that they might not want to explore these things, which I think is a little misguided. But I don't know. There's 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 so many opportunities people just need to actually look for. <laughs> like, just be resourceful, man. At the end of the day, yeah. just do all your research. Learn every single aspect that you can about your craft and then just keep developing it. And then look for people who do the things that you don't do as well mm-hmm. and then link up with them and just, you know, build. <laughs> yeah. Build, like build and network. And that's, and practice. <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's, that's an important part. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. So, hey, yeah. dude, I thank you for having me on the thank show. Thank you for coming up. I, I apologize about the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to all so, the callers that called <laughs> to me during this interview. <laughs> I am leaving that in. This is, <laughs> all those things are gonna, I'm going to make you look terrible. That, that's, that's, that's totally fine. <laughs> but no, thanks for coming out, dude. I really appreciate it. Dude, anytime. All right, sweet. We'll, we'll do another one sometime once you do a few more uh, shows with Snoop Dogg or something. Hey, you, right. Yeah, <laughs> Get his number. Get, me, get him out here for us. I'll come with Snoop Dogg. Yeah, right. bring him. Yeah, we'll do a two-on-one. You and you and Snoop Dogg shoot the shit with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Nice, dude. not a problem. <laughs>